First of all, let me uh, speak a little bit about myself. My name is Daniel Hendy, and I've been a software engineer for over two decades, and I have about five different startups that I've built successfully. I won't talk about the ones that weren't so successful. Uh, my current one is BuildFire, and my previous startup was called Flywheel in the Bay Area. That was basically Uber for taxis before Uber was Uber. And BuildFire is a mobile app building platform that allows people with no technical skills to be able to build mobile apps for iOS and Android and those with technical skills to be able to use our open SDK to uh, develop any functionality that they need. Now I've worked for top brands like PepsiCo, IBM, Qualcomm, World Health Organization and many others. And for the past 12 years I've been focusing my effort more on problem solving, uh, how to grow businesses versus just coding. And Code and Step is my effort to help companies who are struggling with growth achieve the goals that they set. Now what I'm going to be saying today isn't going to be much different than what you already know, but hopefully I can crystallize these ideas and these concepts so that they can become more actionable, so that you can implement them not only in your department, but company-wide. Every business at a low level may have some unique problems. However, if you classify these problems, generally they land in three specific elements or categories. Now, if you can identify which category it lands in, it makes it much easier to diagnose and fix. Now, these three categories uh, are applied to a business, to a department, to a project, to a team. It's always the three P's. It's either a people problem, a process problem, or a product problem. And a product is what you produce, and that could be a physical good, it could be a service, it could be an output of leads or sales or whatever it may be, depending on your department. And these three really classify any problem that may exist in a company. And if you can classify which one of these three have the issue, it's easier to solve. So for example, if you were starting a new business and uh, the people involved is basically just you and you have an idea of what you want to produce as a new product for, for your business, Where's the weak link here? Well, you haven't established a process. And the process is important for your go-to-market strategy, a business plan, a, a uh, feasibility study, a product market fit study, whatever you need, that process to be able to launch a successful business so that your business can actually be launched successfully. If you have an existing business that's a little bit stagnant, you have you and your team for the people. The process is focusing on finishing off tasks in your backlog or whatever it may be. And you probably have a product out there that maybe has high churn if you're a SaaS product. And the problem here could be that your people are too task oriented and not metric oriented and the process is focusing too much on tasks and not the effect of those tasks. And we'll talk about that more in later slides. So, understanding the relationship between people, process, and product, people execute a process to produce a product. Now, that gives you a list of tasks to execute, but you can't focus there and forget people are responsible for the product. And the only way you have a good product is having metrics that measure what you produce. Far too many people focus on the tasks and not the KPIs to know that you're actually pushing the business forward. Now you'll see this in the marketing department as people process in a product, the product is, is leads, sales, the same thing. You have product and customer success and you need fuel in the tank, which is your, your finances. But if you took any one of these departments, they're really composed of the same three elements. So for example, if we took the marketing department, People are, you know, the people, did you hire right? Are you coaching the people that you have? Do you have any dead weight on the team? The process, have you established smart objectives? Other departments outside of engineering uh, sometimes are a little bit looser with uh, the processes for them to produce uh, what they need. Are you following up? Are you communicating between the departments between sales and the product team? Have you built a strong uh, uh, sales funnel, marketing funnel? Um, at the end, what are you producing? You're producing leads. And are you attracting potential customers? Are they the right type of customers? Are you growth hacking? Are you up to, uh, opportunistic? And so these things all uh, let you define the three P's within the marketing department, knowing that they, at the end of the day, 
the people follow a process to produce leads. If you don't have leads, your marketing department isn't doing its job. Same thing for sales. You have to look for the right people. Are they following right uh, processes, whether that's establishing an SDR to AE ratio? Are you ranking your leads? Uh, are there any uh, uh, leads that are not being missed? Do you have an outbound effort? Uh, do you have a balanced commission structure to incentivize them in the, to do the right things and what the business needs for them to focus on? And at the end of the day, what are they producing? They're producing dollars for the company. If they aren't making sales or they, they're not closing deals, if they're discounting too much, if, if they're missing opportunities, they're not uh, producing a good product from the sales department. Again, what are they producing? Dollars for the business. Product and engineering. Now, most everybody here is technical, so they understand this really well. Same, same issue. Did you hire the right people? Are they being coached? Do you have any dead weight? Are you grooming them to become leaders of tomorrow? Uh, your process, do you have a robust SDLC? Are you measuring efficiency? Uh, do you have a bug deficit? Can you measure the ROI of all the efforts that you're doing? And at the end of the day, are you producing a product that people want to buy? Are they task-driven, metric-driven? Uh, do you uh, ask for surveys on the product to see if people are happy with what you're producing? That could be internal or external. Uh, and at the end of the day, are you affecting churn, sales, and, and reducing cost? So let's focus a little bit on people. Now, if you have the right team in place, they will fix the process that will get you a great product. But you need to start with the right people. And to do that, you need to rethink the way you hire, fire, and coach. Now, the way I do it is I like to define every role extremely clearly. Now, most companies that I help say that they've defined this, but at the end of the day, when you actually expose it, it's not. There's a lot of implied and assumed roles and responsibilities, but not actually well documented. Here's a really good experiment that I would encourage everybody to try. Grab a B or C player from your team and ask them to come up with a document that defines their roles and responsibilities. In parallel, you do the same for that role. You'll probably come up with a page, page and a half of bullet points of, of what you think their roles and responsibilities are. A B and C player will probably come back with three or four bullet points. You're lucky if they're complete sentences. That tells you the disconnect on what they think their, jo their job role is and the responsibilities on their plate are versus what you think they are. And there's a disconnect in communication. That's why they think they're doing a good job when you don't think they're doing a good job. Now, if you grabbed an A player, they probably will have a definition longer than yours because they want to grow. Now, the way I like to define these roles and responsibilities is grab every position and break it down to five pillars. Now, the five pillars are derived from the three Ps, people, process, and product. Now, the reason why they're five and not six is because I grab the three and depending on your role, I may focus on two and uh, less emphasis on one of them. So, for example, uh, I make sure that everybody, regardless of your role in the company, whether you're a leader or an individual contributor, you always focus on the product. So that's something I constantly have everybody focus on because at the end of the day, that's what you're selling as a business is your product or your service or whatever it is. And for the other two, it depends if you're a leader, I have you focus more on people. So for example, uh, for leaders, I say you need to focus on yourself. Everybody at, at a bare minimum needs to focus on their self-growth, honing in their skills, being less dependent on others, being able to mentor others and, and slowly grow into uh, their full potential. And then as a leader, I expect you not to just have your circle of influence around you uh, be just uh, containing yourself, I need you to grow towards your team. I need that circle of influence to be magnified to supercharge your team. You make the team better by being their leader. Otherwise, I have the wrong person in that position. I need them to establish the process and make sure everybody follows it. And just like everybody else in the company, I need you to focus on the output of, of the product. That could be a quantity and the quality of the product. I need you to focus there. Now, everybody in the company always needs to make sure that they're doing a, a, a good effort and being efficient, but not reduce quality. 
So as leaders, you need to focus on yourself and your team, establish a process, uh, and focus on the product. Now, as an individual contributor, I need you to focus on yourself, but I need you to spend more time in the process. I need you to follow the process that's been established, and I need you to find ways to improve it. Nobody can really uh, identify weak points in the process unless you're actually implementing the process yourself. So it's important that the leaders listen to the people following this process to say, uh, to understand the feedback and mind that feedback. Some of the feedback is, is fear of change uh, and just friction points here and there. And others are just um, uh, process for the sake of process that don't really you know, move the ball forward. So it's important to listen to those people implementing it to find where there's uh, ways to improve it. And again, they need to focus on the product uh, through uh, producing uh, effectively and efficiently, uh, as well as uh, producing a high quality product. Now, once I've established this document and sat with my team and explained to them what I require of them, I then ask them, well, what do you require of me to achieve those roles and responsibilities to maintain them and make sure that you are an A player on the team? So it's a two-way street. I, I tell them what I need of them, and they come back and tell me what they need from me. And that could be, uh, I need more training. I need more people on my team. I need X, Y, Z. If those requirements are reasonable, it's up to you to make sure that those are actually available to them so that they can actually achieve their potential. The other thing I focus on is what are your goals? Um, it's very important to understand if a team member is planning on outgrowing their position or making a lateral move, or maybe they're just in the wrong position altogether. You could have a, a software engineer who says, in five years, I want to be, have my own business and, and open up my own catering company. Uh, okay, well, we know your heart's not in it, and I know where, how much to invest in you, and as long as your goals and my goals are aligned for the next six months to a year, that's fine, but I know... I shouldn't be grooming you to become a leader because you don't want to be here. Uh, and for those who do want to grow, we need to give them exercises and a, and a path to be able to hone in the skills for their next step. Otherwise, you'll be surprised with somebody leaving the company because they found a growth opportunity in another company and all the time spent getting this person to become an A player uh, is now lost because they left you to go elsewhere. So it's very important to listen to your team and see what their needs are, even a growth within the company. Now, once you've established a document that could look something like this, where you break it down and you're very clear on what's what's expected, they're very clear on what, what are their requirements and what are their career goals, um, it's important to review it together and make sure that you're on the same page and that every uh, metric that you have in your five pillars, as much as possible, it's not always attainable, but as much as possible, be objective and not subjective. Anytime you have a subjective metric, it's difficult to measure, you're going to have miscommunication. I think you did a good job and, and you think you didn't or vice versa. So anytime you could uh, measure uh, via a number, that's, that's always ideal. And always make the metrics about the work and not the person. It's always about the role regardless of who fills in that role. Now, once you've done this, you have a well-defined document. So if you're hiring, you can then give that to your hiring manager or your recruiter or whoever that is. And it's very clear what's expected for this particular role. Now, because we've broken, broken up those five pillars into details and, and what does it take to achieve those five pillars, you can put something as simple as an Excel spreadsheet and put a date and just measure 0 to 5, 0 to 10, whatever it is. It doesn't matter based on the pillars that you've established with this person and then see a trend. Now, it's all about a trend. It's not about a single point. If you have a C player, if you're measuring from 0 to 5 and they're starting at a 2.5, but trending up, you know things are going well. If you have an A player and then slowly they're trending down, you know maybe there's a personal problem. Maybe they've become disinterested. Maybe they're thinking about moving on because you could see the trajectory of where they're going. So all I say is wherever you are, let's improve from there. And as long as the trend is up, then we're headed in the right direction. If the trend is down, then there's a problem that we need to fix. It's never about a single data point. It's more about a trend. 
It's important that they understand that this is coaching. This is not Big Brother. This is about clarity. So spend some time telling them what they did well and what they can improve on. Because again, you, you don't want this just to be a pandering session. You want them to improve. And if you score something a little bit lower, one, hopefully it's objective so that they can measure it themselves. And two, you give them an action plan on how to fix this. And if you're consistent with this, doing this every month, uh, uh, definitely not more than uh, uh, waiting more than a quarter. Uh, I prefer monthly. That they have the feedback and you can see what was the action plan that they were supposed to take last time and did they take it this time to see if they're trending up, if if they're moving, if there's upward mobility or not. Now feedback. The second tab on that sheet, if you were to create a sheet, uh, would be feedback where where the contributor, the team member, tells their team lead if they're fee feeling that they have a meaning in their work? Do they feel that they have autonomy and ownership? Do they feel acknowledged? Do they feel supported, coached, and trained? This is very important to hear the feedback from the ground level, to hear what's going on. What is their perception? If they feel like they're working hard but not being acknowledged, that could be a single person that, you know what, they did do a good job and nobody stopped to say thank you. But if you feel like the entire team says that they're not feeling acknowledged, well, that could mean that the leader isn't spending the time to acknowledge. And that, that means you need to coach their team lead to say, hey, you need to stop and recognize the work that's done because your entire team feels like they're not acknowledged. It's not just one, some one-off person who may have been missed. It's the entire team. And at the end of the day, always the feedback that you hear, take action. Even if it's disagreeing with the team, it's important to take action and tell them why and that it's not just feedback in the wind. They need to know that when they're giving you feedback that you're listening to it. Now, if you've set down clear expectations, you're consistently and constantly giving them feedback and you're showing them support that you're on their team and you're asking them what do they need to succeed and giving them that support that they need, and you've given them a clear path to success, a clear uh, a path for growth. If all this happens, but the person is still not performing. Unfortunately, if you set down those expectations, you're clear, consistent, and you're giving them support, and it's still not working, you need to set them into a performance plan. Now, this is where you put a unit of time where you're clear that it's, it's very clear. Here are the five pillars for you to succeed. And here are the standards for you to maintain this position. Now, I am going to do everything in my ability, whether it's me, whether it's, it's a peer, whoever it is, to support you to make sure that you rise to and above that standard. The one thing I can't do is reduce the standard. So the standards are set for everybody equally. You need to meet them and hopefully exceed them. And you need to be clear with the consequence that at the end of this, we're going to set, set aside three months to make sure you're there. For these three months, everybody's going to support you to make sure that you do achieve your goals. However, if at the end of this time it still doesn't work, there's just a mutual agreement that it's a bad fit. This is where the difference between losing a position and getting fired. Now, there's always budget cuts and, and things that are outside of your hand, but I'm, I'm assuming this is all performance-based. If it's clear to them what the standards are and they see it coming, when you call them into your office for that difficult talk, if it's a surprise, you didn't do a good job in communicating. You, as their team lead, as their manager, didn't do a good job. You need to make sure that it is not a surprise and that they know that you tried everything in your power to avoid this. It's just a bad fit. Let's talk about process. Now, at a company level, the heads of, of the company really uh, are the ones who establish the strategy on how to grow the company and, and see the new heights and where do you want to take it in the next quarter or so. Uh, the problem is, is far too many leaders get bogged down in the weeds establishing all the tactics. Now, what happens there is that if you are establishing all the tactics to achieve the strategies that the company set out, you can get a task-oriented team, and, and you know this when they start giving you excuses like, well, I was just, I was just doing what I was told. Well, that means it's a, a checklist that you're trying to just 
check, 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 and say, I finished the checklist without actually understanding what you're doing and the effect of what you're doing. So for example, if we said, hey, we need to reduce churn by 5% this quarter, and your team members are, are coming back with reporting how many bugs they fixed, let's say they fixed 100 bugs. Okay, is that good? Is that bad? How do I know? I know did it if it affected churn. If you said you, you fixed a thousand bugs, but churn is the same, we didn't accomplish our goal. And far too many teams become task oriented, uh, oriented measuring uh, metrics that don't necessarily give you the core KPI for the business. You didn't push the business forward. Having a number of bugs fixed, what does that mean? It means we know it's good if you if you reduce churn. If you didn't reduce churn, then it's a vanity metric. Now, company-wide, uh, software engineering uh, uh, departments generally are uh, much more disciplined on this, but I'm talking about company-wide between marketing and sales and, and any type of initiative, uh, especially at the, at the department level, need to have smart objectives. Again, this isn't something uh, unique that I, I brought up. These are all industry standards. But if you don't know this, you need to be specific, measurable. Your, your objectives need to be achievable, relevant, and time-bound. So just to uh, take us away from the tech world, let's talk a little bit about sales. Um, you know, if, if you get a leader who says, let's increase sales, uh, great, that's not a smart objective. You know, that's, that's just putting out some wishful thinking. When you want to increase sales, you need to say how. You need to be specific. How are we going to increase sales? That could be something as, uh, let's launch a new vertical. Okay, now you're specific. It's not just throwing it out in the ether, let's increase sales. Now we have a goal to achieve. There's an objective, let's launch a new vertical, and the hypothesis is that'll increase sales. Okay, how do we measure success here? You can't just say, I've launched a vertical. You need to say, I've launched a vertical and increased sales by X amount. That's measurable. That's something that a number can tell you, have you hit that goal or not? Is it achievable? If you come back and you say, I want to double my sales in a quarter. Well, that's not necessarily achievable. You need something in the realm of reality to know that it's achievable. Now, it could be a stretch goal. That's okay. You want to be in a state of flow where it's challenging. It's not too easy and it's not impossible. But you need to have it uh, be within the realm of reality. Now, relevant. Uh, this is important because far too many uh, department leaders, the second they leave the, the strategy session, they get back into being sidetracked with side projects and things that don't actually push the initiatives forward. So it's always important to reassess, uh, is this particular objective relevant to the overall goals of the company? And obviously it needs to be time bound. You need to put a time limit when I'm going to achieve this goal. That could be monthly, quarterly, annually, depending on, on the team and the objective. Uh, but it needs to be time bound. And at the end of that time period, you need to go back and measure and see if we've hit that goal. Uh, have we hit 80% of that goal, 100%, 110%, and how can we do better next time? Now, in terms of tactics, once you've established those strategies, uh, for example, uh, um, launching a new vertical, when you go to the team, you have the team compile a list of the tactics. Which vertical? How do we? Uh, which team do we compile to to uh, uh, take on this initiative? Uh, how are we going to penetrate this market? You have them come up with the tactics, and have your team members own it, so that they know the only reason I did this particular tactic is to hit my smart objective. And if you just hand them down tactics, then they're task oriented. They don't know why or where, nor do they care. You'll just have an apathetic team that tells you, well, I just did what I was told. When you have them compile that list of tactics, now they have ownership of trying to achieve that goal. Now, they could vet it by you. They, you, they may need approval by you. That's all fine. But you have them compile the tactics so that they can own it and measure what matters. Again, in this case, increasing sales, not just launching a vertical just for the sake of launching a new vertical. Did you actually increase sales and did you uh, increase it at the measurement that we were looking for? Working hard versus working smart. I know this is a cliche. I know everybody knows this, but it's very important that your team understands two major things about that saying. Working hard versus working smart 
Is it mutually exclusive? You can work hard and smart at the same time. It's not an either or. That's one. Two, the meaning of that statement is when you work, when you put in effort, make sure it's effective that you have a KPI that you pushed forward, that the business is now better off because of it. Working hard for the sake of working hard, again, fixing bugs. Well, did, did the churn actually uh, get affected? Uh, do we have less churn because of, of uh, working hard? No, then maybe, yes, thank you for working hard, but you didn't work effectively. You didn't work smart. You didn't actually affect the business metric that we're, we're looking for. And that's why it's extremely important that the team understand what is their North Star. In, in the case of churn, it's affecting churn, not achieving 100 bugs fixed. It's did you affect churn, yes or no. Now, talking about product is a wide variety. Now, again, this is the product for the company. If it's a department, your marketing, your product means the leads that you produce, sales is the, the sales that they close, and so on. So this is a wide topic. I won't go into too much detail here. But I will give you the encouragement that if you hire the right people and coach the team you do have to reach their potential, they will help you establish the right process and measure what matters if your process makes sense where they understand the smart objectives and they establish the tactics. They will help you establish the right processes so that the people in the process give you a great product. And remember, customers always vote with their dollars. Every dollar that comes in is a vote towards you're doing something right. Every dollar out is something you're doing wrong. And it's always important to remember that what got you here may not get you there. What got you to a $5 million company may not get you to a $10 million company. So it's important to constantly reassess what you're doing and how you're doing it and reassess the right people who got you to $5 million may not be the right people for $10 million. That doesn't mean you have to fire every single time, but it may mean may, it may mean that you need to coach your current staff to uh, acquire new skill sets so that you're able to grow, or maybe expand the team to have a more diverse skill set. Now, I hope all this gave you uh, clear and logical steps on how to grow your business to new heights. Thanks again for listening. My name is Daniel Hindi, and I hope you enjoyed this presentation.